as far as the day's trade went here this morning, we're back to the we're off to the races again. We had a, a fairly firm close on Friday. The market, the S&P closed higher after a pull after a sell off, and it settled around the 1120 level. And just now at uh, 10, 10, 10, 10 Central Time. The S&P is trading 11.33. We just ran through that big set of buy stops that we've been talking about from the 11.28 to the 11.33 level, and that's the high of the day. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to bounce around a little bit here, back and forth about the markets as they're trading, but really, you know, it's, there's not a lot going on here. This, this kind of drift up type trade that we're seeing in the S&Ps, as much as we like the markets and we think higher, it is a real concern. The lack of volume and, the, you know, the lack of anything really big sticking out. Now, this morning, someone on the IM, a very smart guy, hit us up on the IM and said that somebody bought $3 billion in mini S&P and three billion in notional and mini S and P's this morning on the opener thereafter. That's a very big order. We'll try to go back and forth about that. But what happens when a big buyer comes in on the open the S and P like that on a gap up? Those offers that he is buying from are the offers that are, are that kick in a buy program. We're gonna. That's where we're gonna kick in here now. One of the books that we're gonna talk about this morning is all about high frequency trading. Now back in 1984, 185, right around the time when I met the pit bull in 1987, the crash, he was very, very adamant about that program trading was going to be, was really going to hurt the markets. Now, we're not here to make a judgment call about whether it's hurting the markets or not hurting the markets. We know that it creates huge amounts of volume. But one, we think it's really, really important that if you're day trading the S&P and you're looking at these markets, you got to get some type of background on what this is about. For us, we were pretty lucky. We got to grow up with a guy by the name of Steve Schuler who runs Getco, and he was was trading S&Ps in front of us for years and then somebody came to him and then he formed the largest pro the largest program trading company algorithm trading in the country I don't know exactly what his net worth is but it's gigantic okay and you know what and a, a lot of people hit us up about where we came up with our call or I came up with the call a couple weeks ago and, and really to tell you the truth it's its principles are very basic one everybody thought that the market was going down but when the statistics showed that there were only 20% bulls against 80% bears, that stuck out. That was a key point. But the real thing of this was is how the S&P was back and filling around the 11, 30, 10, 37 level. And we made several higher lows into that, into that time sequence. So that brought me back to a couple of things. You know, as we, as we look at the markets, we don't always want to think that there's, it's one-sided. It's not, of course. If you want to be part of the big move and you're looking to be a seller and the market goes down, great. But that, the markets are two-sided. And what, I wanted, what we want to explain to you as we move forward in this video clip is that there are certain things that traders can do. You know, one of the things that the pit bull was very, very adamant about back in the 80s and 90s was a program trading would ruin the marketplace. It didn't ruin the marketplace. What it did was it ruined professional traders, the guys that were out there running big hedge funds that had big names like like Paul Tudor Jones. Um, let me name a couple. I mean, and we, we handled this. This is a copy of the Market Wizards book. And this is a book that I want to emphasize the most to a lot of people out there because, you know, when you're struggling to look at why the markets are doing what they're doing and they're gyrating around, it's got a lot to do with program trading. And when you break it all down, I just spoke to HL Camp a couple minutes ago and he said that, you know, the program trading can make up anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of the daily volume in the S&P and even more on the big board. So you really, really do got to look at this. Now, some of the some of the great names that were in this book are it's, it's fantastic because our desk actually did business for a lot of these guys. Um, Paul Jones from Tudor. We were there in the '87 crash when Paul was selling S and P's almost every day weeks before the the market sold off. Gary Biefeld. He was one of the largest bond traders in the the Board of Trades bond pit for years. I actually worked his phones long before 500 and thousand lot orders were putting in. Gary was scaling up and down in the bond pit like crazy. No one knew knew who he was. He was a local guy here at the Board of Trade who owned a small clearing firm. You know Ed Sequoia. I knew Ed, who Ed was, but I'd never did any business for him. Uh, um, Michael Steinhardt. We did stuff for Michael Steinhardt. We did stuff for Marty Schwartz. That's the pit bull. Um, we can keep going down Tom Baldwin. Tom Baldwin started in the bond pit right down here. My roommate was actually Tom Baldwin's out trade clerk, and we went. We watched how Tom went from trading fives and tens to trading five thousand lots. 
Now, where are all these guys right now? What, what happened to these guys? What happened to these guys is what a lot of the things that they did were done in the open outcry market. Exactly what's still going on down here in the floor. Something that we think is really, really still important to trading. But beyond that, a lot of these guys have moved on. They've moved on. Paul Jones is a big stock trader now. I'm sure that he still trades S&Ps, but we don't see that biz. Bruce Kovner was another one. We did Bruce Kovner's business. But you know, at, at the end of the day, a lot of this all comes in in this book, and you need to go back to this. There's basic things in that book that can teach the common trader, like looking at the quacha, looking at the trend, looking at the tranny, looking at all these little things. Add them up. You have to do this yourself. It's a little bit of work. But one of the things that helps me, and it's a very simple thing, and you know what? This is the Commodity Traders Almanac. You got that? I've been getting it for 20 years straight. I look at it every day, okay? These are things that help me learn. Okay, and then we're into this. We're into the Stock Traders Almanac. Very simple stuff. The best six months of the stock market starts in November and goes till April. Don't you need to know this kind of stuff? Don't you think that this is important? Well, it's back to this. Yes, program trading does make up a lot of what we do and see and we do and see during the day. But you know what? You've got to learn to live with it. You've got to learn to adapt to it. You've got to trade it. And what we've what we've always noticed is that you got to let the program guys do what they need to do. Once they get done, you may be able to go the other way. Once they sell it, once after three or four sell programs, the market's gone from higher to lower. You get three or four consecutive sell programs. We think that the bids start to clog up the market. And if you can see that when the when we see the locals in the S and P pitter have gone from long in the rally to short into the decline, and you have three or four buy sell programs, we're looking to to be a buyer because we know that those sell programs added more selling to the S and P's, added more locals to getting short, added more retail to getting short, and that's a key, key key element of what we do during the day. We try to pick highs and lows. We're strength weakness traders. We don't necessarily want to get into this thing about you know saying that oh you got to you can't you shouldn't follow RSIs you should follow everything 200 day 200 day moving averages 50 day moving averages 20 day moving averages, 5 day moving average whatever it is that you need to do but you need to have a philosophy and I, what we don't think is that you, you should be afraid of program trading. You should embrace it. You should learn to trade around it. Don't fight it. Some program trading companies out there, and there's one that HL Camp says is XYZ, he says that they deliberately run over retail. He says that he thinks at certain times during the day when the retail is sold down, they come in with buy orders deliberately to force those, to force that retail out of the market and make them buy so that they can come in selling. I don't doubt that. We don't doubt that. But you know what the bottom line is? The pit bull taught us some very basic trading rules. And when you're trading this stuff, you really, really do need to go to this stuff and go through it and, and, and try to adapt to what is going on in the marketplace as we're moving forward. Don't try and fight the market. You stops. You know, adjust your adjust your trading to the amount of money that you have, the capital that you're able to put up. Don't go beyond that. And one of the things that I remember that Marty or Pitbull said in the uh, book, and I reread it over the weekend, was don't add to positions. When you're getting one of the greatest things about what I learned about the Pitbull wasn't that he could make money under extreme circumstances when everything was bad. It was his ability to get out of a loser and get out of his loser was one of the greatest things that you can see. It was all about exiting a position and getting out before it ate him up and so we could come back another day. We'll come back with more of this later in the week and I'll just need to collect my thoughts a little bit but if you have any questions hit us up. We'll see you tomorrow.